Hello, and welcome to The Mind of a Therapist, a podcast where I interview psychotherapists and helping professionals on what they're passionate about in order to provide you with messages of encouragement and hope. I'm your host, Andrew Earl. The Mind of a Therapist is sponsored by Psychological Counseling Services, healing hearts and transforming lives. Look into our intensive at pcsrl.com. In today's interview, I interviewed Dr. Adrian Fletcher. Dr. Fletcher is a licensed psychologist, certified EMDR therapist, certified clinical trauma specialist, and EMDRIA approved consultant in Scottsdale, Arizona. She has 16 years of experience working within the field of mental health. She currently specializes in the treatment of trauma, anxiety, stress management, coping skills, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, adolescents, and young adults. So without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Fletcher. Dr. Fletcher, thanks for being on the podcast today. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, dissociative identity disorder today. And um, to get started, will you just kind of give our listeners, some some are clinicians, some of our listeners are not clinicians, uh, a, a bit of a, a, a definition of what uh, DID, and it's DID for short, right? That's Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, what, what, uh, what, what DID looks like? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. I'm really grateful to be here talking with you today. This is a, a topic that I'm very passionate about speaking with and about and for. Uh, one of my missions is to help the community de- destigmatize, you know, dissociative identity disorder. So as clinicians, we all have the DSM-5 available to us and we can all look up the formal definition of it. The way I like to explain it to it to people is that all people have the ability to dissociate. Dissociation in itself is not uncommon, especially for those who have experienced trauma. And one way that we can all kind of think about that is if you've ever been driving on the highway and you missed your exit, you're like, oh, where did I, you know, where did I go? I missed that exit. And, you know, there's a dissociative phenomenon that happens there. With DID, what happens is when there has been extreme trauma, Typically, you know, in early childhood, the brain fragments out and breaks off into pieces and each part of the brain holds a different experience. Some of those experiences are trauma and others are healthier memories. So with DID, it's actually not uncommon to receive a diagnosis later on in life because the brain has been brilliant in fragmenting off pieces of experiences that had to protect the person from what they endured. And how that shows up and what that might look like in clinical practice is a lot of the times clinicians are not going to see it right away. There's also another stigma or a misconception about DID is that you cannot be a high functioning person and live with this diagnosis, which is also not true. Hmm. Like any other illness, whether it's bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, there are ranges of functioning. However, there is a misconception that people with living with DID are severely disabled and or dangerous. Both, I want to say, are not true. Like any other thing, they are no more dangerous or no more ill than anyone else. So one of the things that I kind of describe to people is, you know, in the media, the way it is portrayed is like there's this rapid shift of personality and all of a sudden you might feel like you're sitting with somebody you don't know actually not how it really presents in clinical practice. You might be a trauma-informed therapist working with somebody with DID for years before you ever actually get the experience of having what they call direct access to an altered state of consciousness or an altered personality. Um, And I know I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but the other thing is in terms of IFS, you know, the internal family systems model, which I love and use in my clinical practice, There is also a misconception or a disagreement for some dissociative survivors because all people have different parts of themselves. People with DID do refer to their other parts as parts. Some refer to them as alters. But because of the new language around, well, it's not necessarily new, but more and more trauma-informed therapists are using the language about parts. It can sometimes be, not to all dissociative survivors, but to some you know, um, a frustration because their parts can literally feel like separate people. 
not just, oh, a part of them that doesn't want to do something. There's literally parts that take over and live and function for them. Um, so I probably gave you a long and short definition of how I go about explaining it. But really, um, another symbol I like to use is the puzzle piece. You know, people with DID have these different parts that have functioned very well to help them survive their circumstances. And the healing process is like one giant puzzle starting to come together. Mm. Well, there's a lot of a lot of curiosities there for me. Um, I'm I'm curious. Uh, you you mentioned that oftentimes people with uh, DID have experienced trauma. Is that always the case? Is it most often the case? Yes, it is. It is absolutely the case. You mm-hmm. cannot develop, you know, DID without going through extreme forms of trauma. Sure. And then for for someone with DID um who you, what's what's that what's their experience with with those different parts is it um a, a voice that people are are hearing what what does that ex- experience generally look like for people sure a lot of the times the internal experience one is sometimes dissociative survivors will describe hearing things when they were very young, like they've always sort of heard a quiet whisper or they can't, there's like this noise or this buzzing and they can't quite make out what it is. And sometimes those parts or those voices can be hidden for years and they're often misdiagnosed as other things. So it's not uncommon for a clinician if they get a new client, if there are multiple diagnoses that this person has shared, whether it's borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, psychosis, a history of self-injury and self-harm, you know, there's a complicated clinical picture most of the time when clinicians get these clients. Um, And a lot of the time, some of that has been hidden. They call it a hidden diagnosis for a reason. It's not um, so readily available because some of those internal parts that people experience will have to feel safe and trusting of other people most of the time in order for those parts to present themselves. Uh. And as you mentioned, you're you're really big on destigmatizing uh, DID, and and as you were talking about earlier, there is this portrayal in the media as people with DID being um, violent, being lower functioning. Um, will, will you talk more on on? what that can can be like for people with DID to experience that stigmatization? Yeah, it's awful, actually. I mean, to just to be quite frank about it, it's very sad. Um, you know, there are people, you know, who are keeping their mental health a secret because they don't feel safe to come out and say, hey, I am a person living with DID and here is my experience because they worry about the impact on their career. They worry, you know, will they be accepted? Will they be believed? It's hard enough for dissociative survivors to deal with this constant battle of, am I making this up? Is it true? Because that's actually a common phenomenon that happens because as the story starts to unfold and people become more aware of their trauma and their different parts and all the things that they have gone through, it's terrifying and denial is a very real part of the process. It's had to be there in order to protect them. And so in the media, like, listen, I know there's a movie called Split. I will tell you that I turned it on to try to see what it was all about and I could no longer continue to watch it. I mean, it's things like that, that portray human beings in a way that is just not reality. Um, And because of that, and because of this misconceptions that have been in the mainstream media for years, people feel too ashamed of who they are, even though there's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. Going through trauma was not their fault. Actually, I always say that, you know, brilliant minds can do great things. Dissociative minds can do multiple great things. Um, You know, their mind is absolutely brilliant, um, but they are too ashamed to come forward based on the mixed uh, messaging and the misconceptions the media has put out there about this illness. I actually don't see it as an illness for people. I see it as a gift, but it takes people a while in recovery to get to the point to be able to see that because even being diagnosed with it is overwhelming and a shock to the nervous system for sure. Yeah. And I mean, even, even in 
that diagnosis is is the word disorder right and is is do you have a, a bit of a bone to pick with with that language I do actually and I know I'm a licensed psychologist I'm also a certified EMDR therapist and an EMDRIA approved consultant but I really don't like the term disorder. As a psychologist, do I need to diagnose? Yes, I do. Um, but I'm really humanistic and I feel like every human being in my office sitting across from me has, a, has an experience and a story and whatever coping skills that they needed to use or whatever coping skills their brain developed in order to survive their experience, that to me is not disorder. That to me is brilliant. And it's just about helping people look at the different behaviors and coping skills that they've been doing and helping them come up with a new tool or a new way to do it and love and appreciation for all parts and alters, you know, without any shame or judgment so they can continue to live their best life. I, want, I feel like once we put the word disorder, you know, whether it's post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative identity disorder, I feel like it sets people up for, again, more stigma and, you know, this thing rather than I am a human being and I have survived the unimaginable and I am functioning and I am committed to my healing process. Mm. Well, listeners can't see me, but I've been nodding my head as you were speaking there because I'm I'm in, in full agreement. I, I've been reading a book called The Choice by Edith Egger, and she's a Holocaust survivor. Um, and she was uh, expressing similar sentiments in her writings about yeah PTSD the the word disorder doesn't fit there because like you were saying when someone experiences trauma this is not their fault and and how they cope with the trauma is actually uh largely a a, a strength I, I I think that's that's my bias mm -hmm. and um yeah I was really drawn to what you were saying as um uh these th this way of functioning is largely a, a gift one can do great things um uh with 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 multiple I identities yes absolutely i'm gonna have to check out that book i always appreciate people that are willing to share their lived experience um and again challenging you know the old school way of of labeling things for sure absolutely and when in in, in the face of um this this stigma and the effects of the stigma in in people's r relationships um w well it before i keep on going uh labeling the experience of did as did do you have different language that you would that that people prefer um who are are, are in the community it, that omits um the the word disorder I think it really, each survivor is really unique to their experience. Um, and sorry for the noise in the background. Oh, it's all right. It's not, yeah. <laughs> um, working from home and, um, you know, having other people in the house has been an interesting experience for all of us. Sure. Um, I want, <laughs> I want to come back to, um, you know, each person, each dissociative survivor will have their own language. You know, there's nothing wrong with the language that they choose for themselves. When I'm working with clinicians, I teach them about honoring the preferred language of the client that they're working with. So for example, there are some that are absolutely okay and comfortable with, you know, the full on label of DID. It's important to them. It helps them organize their experience and they speak openly about it. For others, they like to prefer to themselves as a dissociative survivor of trauma. Um, some people prefer alters. Some people prefer parts. So it's really just for the purpose of our interview, we're, we're doing it on DID, so I'm fine to use that language. But to emphasize to clinicians, please check in with your clients about their preferred language because each survivor is really different and unique and how they would like to refer to their parts and their lived experience. Mm. Well, I, I appreciate that. And you're, you're preaching to the choir here. I have uh, grounded my work in, in narrative therapy. And so, you know, the spirit of narrative is uh, very much so in align with with honoring people's language and their understandings of of their experience. So I appreciate that. And so so, so um for someone who's facing this stigma with 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 DID, how how um how do you see people uh 
navigating relationships, healing in in the face of uh, this stigmatization? Yeah, and, and again, it's going to be unique to, to everyone. So I'm going to um, take a turn and then I'll probably circle back around. So there's one of the, the organizations that I'm actually going to be speaking for in February is called An Infinite Mind. And it's a great organization that is committed to destigmatizing DID and educating the public. They put on a conference every year. I, I believe this year is going to be their 12th year. And it's called Healing Together. And it provides education for survivors, their therapists, and supporters um, to be better informed about DID. Um, and they have everything there from, you know, therapists and researchers talking about what it looks like in the research and also people sharing their lived experiences. Um, and so that's one way um, to kind of get educated because for different people, sometimes disclosure is necessary for their healing process. For others, it is not. It is really a unique experience, but in terms of navigating relationships, it is a journey. Because each, you know, for somebody living with DID, whoever is in relationship with them isn't just having a relationship with what I sort of refer to, and I know it's an old school term, as a singleton. You know, especially those who are really, really close to the survivor. You know, usually spouses or family members are going to have an idea that that person has multiple parts. Um, and especially for spouses, it can be extremely challenging because they have to build a connection in a relationship. Usually you start to see that towards the, you know, healing or integration type of process. Um, and if the supporter or the loved one has a hard time building a connection with those different parts, it makes for a very challenging relationship. Mm. For the more distant relationships, it's not so challenging, although it kind of can be because you're trying to navigate um, you know, different feelings, mood alterations and things like that. Um, but I would say for those who are closest to the survivor, they're going to see, um, and get experience and direct access, you know, to those altered states. Uh huh. And, and for those who are loved ones, um, uh, it, noticing these different parts, um, what are, what are some of the unhelpful things that you see loved ones do at times, maybe good intentioned? Um, and then what are things that people can do to, to support someone with DID? Yeah, absolutely. Great, great questions. And, and so important. Big theme, boundaries. Boundaries on both sides. So, you know, with somebody with extreme trauma, you know, that has a lived experience of DID, navigating everything from issues around power and control, chores, responsibilities, spending, um, sexual activity, emotional intimacy. All of those have different layers and different components. And each person in relationship, whether it's a spouse, a friend, or a family member, need to have boundaries on both sides. Because for somebody who's a spouse or a loved one, you could very easily experience you know, vicarious trauma, especially if parts are sharing different pieces of their memory. We, we want to be mindful that the spouse and the loved ones, you know, are because they also love the person most of the time, right? Well, at least we would hope if they're in relationship with them, um, you know, that it can take a toll on that person's mental health too, if there's not any boundary. So you mentioned what are some things that, you know, even if it's good intentioned could be maybe problematic. So maybe some themes of some codependency and being too much of a caretaker, not giving the person with DID the capable card to show up for themselves or their parts or playing the role of therapist when you really need to be playing the role of supporter, not of therapist and things like that. And that is true for both sides, whether you're the person living with DID or the, or the supportive person. It all comes down to setting boundaries and having really hard conversations about what what that person needs, um, because I'll give you an example, there may be a part that shows up that wants to engage in sexual activity, for example, and maybe it's a younger part. And really, if the spouse engages with that, it can be re-traumatizing to the dissociative survivor. So it's about having those conversations. If your experience is in this part right now, I'm not going to engage. I want to, you know, um, be engaging in sexual activity with the adult part of you. Sure. And so that's just an example where things can get really complicated. And 
um, you know, where there can be a lot of emotional dysregulation and breakdown for both sides. And when I say breakdown, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about, um, you know, a huge psychological breakdown, but a breakdown in the relationship, the dynamic, um, and cause more, you know, dysregulation. Sure. So, so I'm hearing having conversations that would be unique to each person about boundaries that would be important to, to set when certain parts are, are present. Um, with that example, you know, having a conversation of, okay, here's how we identify, here's how you can identify when this part is present. And this mm-hmm. would be a, a boundary would be s- sexual activity in, in that case. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Being able to, you know, having to, you know, um, pause, stop, not engage, um, you know, and have both people on board about, you know, what's happening. And that includes like another, you know, another one is it's not uncommon for dissociative survivors to experience um, spending. They might have a part that, you know, doesn't have boundaries around finances or have any limits and they, you know, run themselves into, you know, a certain amount of debt because they may not have what I call co-consciousness and it's in the research. So co-consciousness means um, you can have part, multiple parts present. You might have one that's a little bit more out front and the host or, you know, the person may be witnessing what's happening but not necessarily have a lot of control over what's going on. And then there are times where it's very fragmented, where there is another part that has taken over and is out front um, and they haven't communicated with the rest of the parts. And when that happens, you know, people tend to, you know, engage in behaviors, you know, that when they come to, they're like, oh my goodness, you know, I did not realize that this had happened. And that can be absolutely terrifying for a survivor. Sure. And with, um, these different parts coming up, are there general patterns with, with how long um, other parts are c- come to be and, and stay, stay present when there, there isn't that um, uh, co-consciousness? You know, it's really interesting about, you know, and there's a lot of questions around that, like, well, you know, do parts disappear? Do they come back? Like what happens? And Here's what I remind clinicians, no dissociative identity disorder system is the same. Mm. It is nearly impossible to try to look at one person's experience and compare it to another. We can have general ideas like the diagnostic criteria, the language, and have an understanding of what's happening. And we can look at the research, but in terms of the lived experience, there are some people that experience parts going dormant for a really long time. And then there are some that, you know, are dealing with what I call living with functional multiplicity and, you know, they are um, managing their daily life with more than one part. Um, And so I can't really answer directly that question per se, because again, it comes down to each DID system being so unique um, and how, how they function. Yeah. And, and so is, is that similar then for the co-consciousness as, as well whether your primary part is conscious when another part comes up? Yes. So it, you know, again, that is something that um, sometimes that's present and sometimes it's not. And it really just depends. I will tell you though, that under extreme stress, people and their loved ones are likely to experience those parts and rapid switching much more frequently than let's say if stress is low that's why working with dissociative survivors, you know, there is a lot of chaos typically in the early presentation when they come into treatment. Uh, um, you know, they may have a lot of things going on in relationships. You know, there might be a lot of stress around work, whatever it is, when the stress is high, the person is likely experiencing more switching of, of different parts. When stress is low, things are more manageable. Sure. That makes sense. And um, are there basic uh strategies that that you often recommend for for coping with stress when someone is consulting you who has a lot of stress in their their life and is experiencing those those shifts yeah i mean i love i like to consider myself like the self-care lady (laughs) i'm all about (laughs) self-care i was trying to come up with like a really cool idea to do something um about self-care um 
I love to help people. I come back to, if we want to talk, you know, literature and theoretical orientation, DBT skills are fabulous for dissociative survivors. And I say that with, you know, not manualized treatment necessarily, but pulling from different therapeutic modalities and different schools of thought to equip somebody with self-care strategies that are going to work for them. Yeah. So whether, whether that's, you know, the five senses grounding technique, diaphragmatic breathing, thought challenging, um, things that are sensory um, or experiential, like music, art. Um, taking time out, yoga, you know, is really big. So again, each survivor is going to have their own preference and their own limitations to what they're willing to do or not willing to do, especially when it comes to body stuff. Um, but I'm all about equipping people with, you know, emotion regulation techniques. So basically interpersonal effectiveness, learning how to use your voice, set limits, have some boundaries. Um, the emotional regulation component of keeping, you know, the, the nervous system calm and centered um, and also mindfulness, you know, which is also part of the emotion regulation practices as well. Mm. Well, and you, you mentioned there the, the, the five senses exercise, and I'm familiar with that. I don't know if we've talked about it before on this podcast, and I love to give our listeners something practical. We, would you, you, would you mind going into a little more detail on what that looks like, the, the, the five senses uh, exercise? Sure. Yeah, it's a grounding technique, I, I, I believe, originally developed by Marsha Linehan, and I think all of us trauma-informed therapists probably sprinkle it in, you know, with when we're working with trauma, and even not with trauma, you know, when I work with adolescents dealing with school anxiety, you know, I teach them about five senses. So it's really what you can hear, touch, taste, smell, and see. And I usually have people, one, I teach it in my office and I just say, you know, can you look around my room and tell me, you know, all the things in here that are the color blue? What do you notice that you can smell? What is it around you that you can hear? Can you taste something? You know, I often have cold water in my office or mints available. Um, and then touch, you know, can you describe the texture, you know, of the pillow next to you and things like that. But then I ask people to develop their own five senses grounding kit. And actually, when I was working as a, as a postdoc for PCS, there was another therapist, um, you know, who I learned that from. And then it helped me teach my clients. And, um, you know, it's about like having little things that you can kind of throw in your bag or in your car that are just easily accessible. Maybe it's essential oil. Maybe it's chapstick. Maybe it's mint. Maybe it's a little perfume or a soft, cozy sweater that you can bring to therapy. You know, whatever it is, the more um, you can activate those five senses can help calm the nervous system and help you be more present and come back down to being grounded. I usually pair that, you know, with diaphragmatic breathing also, because it can just help really recenter and, you know, soothe somebody's nervous system in the moment. And then I teach, you know, my clients to be able to put that into practice when they're not in my office, if they get triggered about something at work, or at home. Um, and people get real creative with the five senses grounding. You know, I love, I love hearing about that. Wow. I, I hadn't heard of it before with, uh, making a five, five senses kit where you have, you know, essential oils or, and things that, um, are soothing to you that that's, that's, that's brilliant. I like that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. A lot of my adolescents really like the koosh balls, which are probably from the eighties, but you know, I have a bunch of them in my office. Um, and those are great too, because they're sensory, their texture. Um, and actually on Amazon, you know, there's all different kinds of sensory um, little kind of fidget things that you can get for, for your office for clients. Um, and, you know, people do appreciate that. Hmm. And I always try to remember what we are teaching, you know, in our office, because psychoeducation is such a big part of my practice as well. Um, you know, what we're teaching and modeling for our clients, you know, in our office, hopefully transpires outside the office. And so I love when my clients come in and they share with me the art they did over the weekend when they got overwhelmed or that they picked up a new adult coloring book and some new gel pens, um, you know, stuff like that just makes my heart happy because when you're dealing with trauma, you really have to offset working through the darkness and the pain that has happened for people and then offsetting it with those experiences that are going to bring joy and calm and peace. And joy, calm, and peace can be absolutely terrifying to dissociative survivors in the beginning of their healing process because they were never allowed to drop their guard enough to experience those feelings. There was always something threatening coming later. Hmm. Well, will you say more about that? Uh, 
you said it's often terrifying for for folks to with, with DID to move into the experience of, of of joy. Yeah, absolutely. So you know how we're kind of taught in the field, like we want to help people expand that window of tolerance for distress or discomfort. I'm a big proponent on we need to help our survivor clients build the tolerance for joy, happiness, and creativity. Because when there's been extreme trauma, um, you know, when I say always, you know, obviously, you always want to challenge those always must, you know, so I want to be clear about my language in the presentation that I'm, you know, each, again, survivor is going to have their own experience. However, when there's been extreme trauma when people are younger, and that PTSD response has been activated so early, their brain has never really had the experience of dropping into safety, or there might have been grooming behaviors, um, you know, that have led the person to believe, oh, this is going to be joyful and fun, whether it's ice cream or Disney World or the movies, and then abuse happened as a result right after. So the brain gets this of like, um, wait a second, love, happiness, then came abuse. And so as they get older and they're working through their trauma, when they experience, maybe they're out with a friend and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, internally they can feel, oh, I'm happy to be here. And then quickly might, what might take over is fear of, wait a second, you know, how can this actually be a joyful experience? Because in the past, you know, if we think EMDR perspective, you know, present day triggers often lead back to past experiences. How do we, how do we actually feel safe right now if back here I didn't? So it can be very confusing, especially in the early stages of recovery. So mm -hmm. expanding those experiences. And I'm not saying that people who have experienced extreme trauma had absolutely no joy, no happiness, or no positive um, experiences. Actually, one of the things I also teach in my practice is to look at who was safe in your life? Maybe it was only five minutes with, you know, the really sweet babysitter down the road, but maybe she was safe and joyful. And that person can then rely on, you know what, that woman down the street was always so kind to me. Um, you know, she didn't actually hurt me. She was my refuge, you know, instead of going home. Mm. Um, so again, I'm not saying they didn't have any positive experiences, but the overall majority, especially for those living with DID, those early years were extremely traumatic. Sure. And, and, and so joy can just be unnerving. Mm, that, that makes sense. And, and, and in those early stages, uh, phases of, of recovery, what um, do you often find is helpful for people uh, to move into to joy and, and, and creativity in a way that it feels safe to them? Yeah, that's really a great question. And, and I think it's going to be each person's experience, but I will tell you that I help create that in my office. So one, I want to say the best thing you can do for a trauma survivor, and I know all therapists listening are going to be like, yes, we know this is to be seen, heard, and validated, even for the parts that show up that may be difficult or combative with a therapist. When I think combative, I'm talking verbally, okay? To be seen, heard, and validated will start to build trust and safety in the therapeutic relationship. And if you can build trust and safety in the therapeutic relationship, the survivor working with you is going to be more open to maybe trying some art therapy in your office or listening to some music. I always ask my clients, you know, when they're working on stuff, if we're doing an experiential, is there a song that you really like that you'd like me to play for you? You know, and um, I step outside of the, the rigid box of psychology and just I'm human with them. You know, how was your weekend? What brought you joy or happiness? Or what did you notice? Can you create that right now on a piece of paper? Can you draw it? Can we pair it with music so that they can start to experience what that is like. I celebrate my clients in my office. You know, if somebody is accepted and it doesn't have to be a big um, thing that they do or accomplish, but you know, if they get into college and they've been working on their recovery for the past two years, we celebrate that. You know, there's balloons at my office. We're putting on music, dance movement therapy is a thing. You know, if they finally use their voice and set a boundary with somebody, we're cheering for that. You know, I think it's all about giving somebody an experience that they maybe haven't had. Mm, absolutely. It, and I was reminded as you're talking there of 
uh, Michael White, he once wrote something, him and Epstein, I think, wrote something along the lines of, it's not the the size of uh, the, the step that matters, but, but just just the step, you know, like any, st- it, the, but the direction, that's what it was. And I, I, I love that you are creating that place. And, and that reminder too is always helpful for me of just um, to, to show people the unconditional positive regard and acknowledgement and really see people and, and acknowledge the steps that they're taking in their life. I think that that's, that out of that, you know, can come so much growth. Absolutely. You know, I've seen too, too much, you know, early on in people's training. And to be honest, I was this way, you know, years ago, I was this way, just coming out of my internship, um, you know, working in in a VA hospital where it was more, you know, CBT focused, which is fine. Um, And then, you know, showing up at PCS and learning a whole bunch of information about trauma informed care and experiential modalities that sometimes I think it's coming back more now. Um, but you know, I've seen too many times in those first initial intakes of like, I'm just trying to get the story and I'm just trying to get the symptoms. And then I got to figure out the diagnosis. I'm going to say, no, wrong answer. You are there to build a connection with a human being. Mm -hmm. You will get the story. You will have an understanding of the symptoms. The diagnosis is less important than showing up and having an understanding. Like if I had to choose one old school therapist that would be like my idol would be Carl Rogers. Unconditional yeah. positive regard, genuineness, the hopefulness factor, meeting people where they are at. Mm. Um, and you know, too oftentimes I think people are trying to get all the symptoms and write everything down in the intake. I do have a luxury, you know, of being a private pay practitioner where I'm not you know, forced to turn over a diagnosis in 24 hours for an insurance company. But even for those who take insurance, you have got to slow down and be in the moment with your client. Um, And, you know, I always tell my clients the biggest gift that they could ever, you know, give me is their trust. And I tell them right off the bat that that trust is not going to come readily. You know, because clients will want to bring me little cards or little trinkets and things to express their gratitude to me. And I always say, these, you know, and there's a lot of research on gifts in psychotherapy, and we can have a whole ethical discussion around that. But I will tell you that dissociative survivors want to show their therapist gratitude. And I always tell them trust is the best gift that you can ever give me. And of course, I don't minimize when they want to give me a card. I think that that's lovely. Um, And, you know, for them to, for me to be able to hold the space for a dissociative survivor of trauma is an honor because these type of clients have seen multiple therapists. They have bounced around trying to be seen, heard, and validated. They have ended up on a boatload of prescriptions. They have a huge diagnostic file and that's not okay. Yeah. And so speaking, if you're to speak to some of these there well you know you're speaking to a lot of a number of therapists right now and um what what are some of the biggest uh messages that that you're wanting to communicate to therapists so that people with DID don't slip through the cracks like you're saying and have seen a number of therapists that that haven't been helpful what are what are some of the biggest messages that you you've maybe mentioned already in our conversation or maybe not that you'd want to uh, share with therapists? Yeah. Um, I really think, you know, for, I think therapists are scared a lot of the time, not all, but some, you know, I've heard things like, um, I treat OSDD, which is otherwise specified dissociative disorder. Um, but I don't treat DID. Well, really the treatment is not that different folks, because you, if you show up and you consult, I cannot say that enough. Consult, consult, consult call people that work with dissociative survivors, ask the question, know your areas of competence and, you know, and be mindful. If you have to turn somebody away because you don't feel competent to treat it, please do the legwork to help the survivor find another therapist. It is hard enough for these survivors to call and ask for help. And then if they get in your office and you do realize that there's something more severe going on here that, is beyond your level of competence. Don't just pick any random three names and send them on their way. Do the legwork to help these survivors get to the right place because if not, 
you're just like contributing to the pattern of now you're they're going to go call three of your other colleagues who also don't treat it or don't know how to treat it. Um, and then it just becomes a defeating process and people give up. And I'm also not okay with that either. Mm. Um, and so, and th- I read this great article, um, Caroline Spring, she's out of the UK. She's a person with lived experience. She's also a social worker. She puts a lot of education, training, and research out there about DID. She wrote this great article on, I'll have to find it and maybe you can post it with your podcast or something, Andrew, but um, like 10 steps to working with, a, you know, somebody with dissociative identity disorder or 10 things you should know. And one of them was, you know, let's say you've been working with a trauma survivor for a really long time. Maybe you're a certified EMDR therapist. Maybe you've seen this client for five years and then you realize, oh my goodness, I missed this. And this is what I think this person is going through. Please have a conversation with your client about it. Please take accountability and responsibility that you missed it. And then make the commitment to either help that client by getting the right consultation and supervision or find them the right connection. Because in that article, she talks about how there's not a lot of people to refer to. And if you have an existing relationship with a client, it's not just a new client that you just saw for for two hours doing an intake and you realized it, right? But if you're invested and you've been helping this client for five years, don't just send them on their way. At least try to get consultation and supervision to see if you're able to do the work to do it. And if you're still not and you're not comfortable, please help them get to the right place. Because I've seen time and time again, well, you know, I was seeing this therapist for a really long time. And, you know, they don't treat DID, so now I have to find someone else. Where are they going? Please tell me where they're going, because I'm going to hopefully work with this organization out of Florida um, to be part of their referral network to put together a solid referral list across the country to where these survivors can go for appropriate care and, you know, responsive treatment. Absolutely. And for, for people who are interested in, uh, expanding their knowledge on this topic? Are there some resources or some areas to send them the, we'll, we'll try to put that, uh, Caroline or Carolina Springs? Uh, Caroline Springs. Caroline she's Springs. out of the, yep. She's out of the UK. Um, Colin Ross is a psychiatrist out of Texas. He's got the trauma recovery Institute in Texas. He's put out a lot of books and done a, re- a lot of research on DID Um, And then there is Discussing Dissociation, which is actually an online educational forum. And um, the woman who runs that is a social worker. um, And she's got a brilliant community on there with a lot of helpful information um, on her on her website. And then she does private consultations as well for therapists, too, who need help understanding DID systems and the intricacies of everything that's going on on the inside for people. Mm. Absolutely. Well, we'll get um, that in the show notes and then we're getting to the end of the episode. I think I could keep talking with you for, you know, another hour here, but um, if people want to get in touch with you, what, where, what, where would we uh, want to direct them? Sure. Um, they can find me on my, on my website. It's just www.drfletch.com, just drfletch.com. Um, I'm in, also in the process of launching my uh, other consultation business, which is called Altercology, and I really look forward to getting that off the ground. I'm also sponsoring the Healing Together Conference in Florida this year, and I'll be speaking there. So um, Altercology will have a website and a way to contact me for that because I hope to do public speaking events um, and help educate therapists across the country about you know, the lived experience of DID and treating it. Perfect. And then um, the question I like to ask at the end of every episode is what's a message of hope you'd like to leave the listeners with today? Sure. My message of hope is that recovery and lasting change are possible. It is a journey and, um, and it doesn't have to just be the traditional journey of psychotherapy. There are plenty of alternative healing methods, um, alternative healing methods out there that can be beneficial to survivors with the right referral. So body work, yoga, um, energy healing, you know, it doesn't just have to be, you know, the traditional route of, of therapy. I think there's a lot that comes into one, but really the biggest take home message is, you know, healing from DID and learning to live with functional multiplicity um, because there's a lot of misconceptions about integration as well. 
is possible and you can live a beautiful, brilliant life. It's just a journey. And if you have the right people come alongside you on the journey and you're not afraid to ask for help and, you know, can learn how to set limits and boundaries for yourself and with others, I mean, things can be so beautiful, Hmm. you know, pain, you know, there's a lot of pain in DID. And I do believe that when people are committed and they keep putting, like you talked about baby steps earlier, one foot in front of the other, that they can heal. And that life doesn't have to be the dark, the dark ways that it always was. You know, there is really light at the end of the tunnel. So that would be my message of hope. No, nah. well, that's that's a great message to end with. And thanks, thanks so much again for being on the podcast today. I've appreciated it. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. please press the subscribe button as well as rating and review in our podcast. This helps others connect with what you've been hearing. If you have any questions, please contact us at themindofatherapist at gmail.com. These questions will be kept anonymous. I want to thank Eric Price for the wonderful music you hear in this podcast. Additionally, this podcast was created to provide accurate and authoritative information on the subject matter. Although we are interviewing licensed therapists, they are not your therapists. This podcast is not intended to serve as direct medical advice and should not be used as a substitute for direct professional health. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, guests, or PCS are rendering legal, clinical, or other professional information. If you need a professional, we encourage you to find one. Visit Psychology Today to connect with a licensed clinician near you.